trumpets call. There's no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. All right, Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. Hallelujah. When you feel like you don't have enough, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Rapha. My healer. Okay. When you get up in the morning and you, you start hitting the age like I am and you hear your father, Okay, you know what I mean? You get up and hear, oh, dad, God is my healer. 
Jehovah Nisi. God, my banner. I go under the banner of the Most High God. When I have to go into battle, the Most High God goes before me. He fights my battles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that's why I feel like shouting. My favorite, because I just like saying this word, Jehovah Sikhanu. My God, my righteousness. Because of him, I can stand in right standing. Hallelujah. All right, we've got praise reports today. Now, we do our praise reports because we want to break up fallow ground. If you are a, a, a farmer, or a, a gardener, you know in the spring, this is the time when we're getting our gardens together. And if you have uh, your, your ground that is hard and unworkable, you need to bust that up so it will be receptive for the word. So when we look at what we do in our praise time, we want to break up fallow ground. We want to be good ground for the word of God to come. Have you ever been come to, to church in the morning with the one that God has given you and sometimes your jaws are a little bit tight <laughs> all right I, my wife's giving me the look <laughs> but but you know what how does God work with you when your jaws are tight that's why we've got to break up that fallow ground so we focus on the most high God amen all right, I've got a praise report from Miss Gladys. She had a nosebleed for 24 hours. Uh, she held on to Psalm 107.20, and it self-resolved. Thank God for his word and the teaching we get. Amen? Thank you. Jehovah who? Jehovah Rapha. Hallelujah. I've got one from... Okay, I always do this. Rashawn, I'm thanking God and praising God for our church family, Lamar and Mandy and, um, yes, Amanda, okay. <laughs> Childs graciously opened their home for their daughter Alexis's surprise bridal shower last weekend. Mm. It's great to be family. It's great to have family extended family and especially church family. Did I turn it over? Oh, I hate to turn it over one. Oh, oh my God. Oh, all right, here we go. Uh, it was intended to be an outside event, but thanks to the elements, which included rain, sleet, wind, and snow. <laughs> yeah, we were wondering about the whole garden thing. <laughs> okay. Sleet and snow, okay. Um, with hesitation, they, they allowed it to be moved inside. Alexis was extremely happy and surprised and grateful. Amen? Amen. Amen. From Ethel, she's thanking God for those he has placed in her life. For their checking in on her last week, it helped her to recover quickly. Once again, Jehovah Rapha. I have one from Miss Kim here. Oh, I have one from Kimberly. I'm sorry. <coughs> she had the pleasure of meeting Dawn, a new believer who is hungry for the Lord. Let me stop right there. What a privilege we have when we're able to minister to anybody, but especially new believers, to minister the word of God, to be able to just share with them who God is and what he has done for us. All right, she shared her story. Okay, I jumped the gun. Uh, of a new, as a, of a new near-death experience and watched her body, as she watched her body from above, she felt an intense peace. Uh, she now has zero fear of death and a sweet passion to live for Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Let's take our offerings in our hands, our tithes, and let's receive, let's uh, repeat our offering confession. Now, before we do this, we want to say, if you are a visitor, your tithes go to your home church. 
right? And God said, we've never seen the righteous baby for bread. Up. Okay. We, we've never seen the righteous begging for bread. So if you're a visitor, we, we love having you here. Todd's got a group. I love Todd's group. I've been talking to him all day. That's why I'm so behind. But if you're visiting with us, don't feel compelled. You don't, we're not looking for money here. We're supporting God's ministry. So our offering confession is, in honor to God, I bring my tithes and I sow my offerings into the kingdom of God. Every penny will produce for God and for me. The gospel is being preached. Souls are being saved. Lives are being changed. Bodies are healed. And Satan's works are exposed and defeated. It will produce for me. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Will God give back to me through the hands of men that I might give again? I count it as done in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to pray. is fading Walls of fear Brick by brick will come down Your light will shine Lifting me out of the shadows For here and now I know where my breakthrough I'm gonna sing my way out of the valley I'm gonna shout my way up to the mountain I will take hold of the truth of your promise I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I'm gonna push through till every light crumbles
bow, you have to bow. All that's the things that demand my attention, you have to bow. Say, you fear have and depression. To bow. Fear and depression, shame and confusion, you have to bow. You have to bow. All that's the things that demand my attention. You have to bow. You have to bow. Fear and depression. Shame and confusion. You have to bow. You have to bow. All that's the things that demand my attention. You have to bow. You have to bow. i
trust you. Every storm, every situation, every trial, as we go through it, we learn to trust our God. The enemy is always trying to feed us lines to get us to doubt you, to get us to think that you don't care, you're not mindful of us, your word doesn't work. And Father, through each one, we can learn to trust you more. And we're growing in that trust. We're getting stronger. And we are a formidable foe for the enemy. Glory to God. I thank you, Father, that what lies ahead doesn't cause us any unrest because we trust in you. As we look to your word here this morning, I thank you that your spirit is present to teach us and instruct us, give us the revelation that we need for the things we will encounter. We give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, you may be seated. You want me to hand her up there? Thank you. Nothing more special than granddaughter falling asleep on you. It's kind of surprising. She's back there fighting with me with all sorts of stuff, pulling out my handkerchief and stuffing it back in and playing with my microphone. And then all of a sudden she wasn't. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, we're going to be over in 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're not done with peacemakers, mostly because after the church last Sunday, a couple of you asked me some questions on this, and I said, well, it looks like we got a little bit further to go on it. And um, I'd rather not move on until we're finished, because, uh, you know, we rotate around on topics. When I get on a topic, we're on it for sometimes 10, 15, 20 weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and then we don't come back to it for a while, because we're on to another topic. But the idea of a peacemaker, uh, one who would bring peace into the situation, is something that's important for us to, to know and understand. And some of the situations that you all were bringing up, we want to uh, help you out with that. But we know that God blesses the peacemakers. But what do you do if one of the people in the process, the way you're trying to bring peace, is belligerent, antagonistic, and just downright evil? What does God expect of you? Because that's what we really need to know. What does God expect me to do? If I understand what God expects me to do, I can live up to his expectations. And his expectations are never outlandish. You can always do what he says to do. But I need to find out, what is it that God wants me to do? And so I, I looked around for a story that would, that would help us understand this. And I found one in this particular uh, chapter here in 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're going to take a look at what this peacemaker did with one party who was belligerent, antagonistic, and just downright evil. So evil that God rejected him. Now, last week we were looking at Abigail. We saw that being a peacemaker is not easy. It takes some of the qualities of maturity that we already went over. You need to be steadfast. That's one of the qualities. We've been looking at seven qualities of maturity. Not that there are only seven qualities of maturity. Just we're looking at the top seven. If you can get these seven down, you will find yourself getting to the place of being mature spiritually. First one was steadfastness. Not being moved off of your stand by what others say or accuse you of. The second one was patience, 
That's not letting your emotions move you off of where you are. Being calm was the third. Things can get hostile. And others will not be so calm. And you need to bring calm into that situation. Your level of calm is important if you're going to be a peacemaker. And the fourth one we've been on here, and that's peace. You, first of all, must be a person of peace in order to be a peacemaker. If you are not a person of peace, you won't be making much peace. That just, that's not going to be happening. Anyone can call strife. As we uh, quoted, or we rephrased this to Charles Barkley terminology. Any knucklehead can call strife. I love the way he phrases some things. <laughs> all you have to do is be selfish and uncaring. And you can create strife. But to be a peacemaker, that requires a lot more. We left you this question last week. Are you up to the task? Are you up to the task? Now, we looked at a couple of things last week on this also, that goodness, truth, and judgment, these are all important. These are, it is, it is important for you to understand what is good and what is not. It's important for you to understand what is truth and what is not truth, and it's important for you to make correct judgments. But sometimes we are moving the importance of those things up over being a peacemaker, and we are sometimes causing strife over issues that we don't have the full truth on yet. How many of you have changed some of your doctrine in the last 10 years? You learned some things in the Word. The rest of you ought to get saved. <laughs> if you're learning the things of God, you're going to understand the Word of God more. What I understand the Word of God to be now is the, is the best I have been able to grab hold of it. But I expect that 5, 10 years down the road, I'm going to say, Man, I believe that? Oh, how, how crazy was that? And uh, you all know I'm a Star Trek fan. Any other Star Trek fans here? I love Star Trek, I, whatever one, just about any one. They've come up with some new ones, and I just don't, I don't get into them, the new ones too much. But uh, they did this one scene in there where the, everybody remember the whale one? I think the whale one was one of my favorite ones. They had so many lines in there I've used in sermons. <laughs> but they had one where, where Bones, the doctor, he's going through the hallway. And you remember he found that person who was a diabetic? And he was talking to her. He says, uh, what are you in for? She says, I have diabetes. I'm waiting for... Uh, Oh, whatever, what is it, treat? dialysis. And I loved his comment. Dialysis. What are we, back in the Stone Ages? Take one of these. He pulls out of his little uh, doctor bag there, gives her one of these one little pill, and then he goes on. They, of course, they do this stuff in the hospital, and then they're trying to run out of the hospital because whatever they did, they got caught. <laughs> I don't even remember what it was, but I remember him running by this lady, and here she's waving her arms, kicking her legs. I'm healed. <laughs> she's, she's all better just from that one little pill. Why? Because what we do now is the best thing that we know. But down the road, we're going to find out some other things. How many of y'all glad, glad we don't think that leeches are the best thing medically? <laughs> Anybody glad about that one? We've grown. You're going to grow in some things in the Word. You've got to be careful that you're not so stuck on the truth that you know now that you will create strife over it. Now, there are some truths that you will. We went over a little bit of that last time. There are some truths in the Word of God that you need to create some strife over. <laughs> Jesus created some strife over some truths. But you've got to have the wisdom to know which one. But anyway, we don't want to spend all of our time reviewing. We want to get into the story. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have, there's going to be a cliffhanger. There will be a cliffhanger. You may not like me when we hit it. But I'm telling you right now, there will be a cliffhanger. You have to come back next week or just tune in, you know, on the, online or whatever way that you want to, to do that. But over here in 1 Samuel chapter 19, let's take a look at this. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in the secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you, that what I observe I will tell you. Now, in case you haven't figured it out, Jonathan is the peacemaker. David is not. Now, there's a reason. We looked at it last time in Abigail, and David was not a peacemaker. He was a war maker. He is ready to come in and kill them all. This is not the reason that David is not the peacemaker here. And you, you can take a great lesson from this. The reason that David is not the peacemaker is David is not in a position to make peace. There are people in your life, 
you are not in a position to bring peace into the situation. If you try, you will make it worse. You just got to know there are some situations you can't do it. What would happen if David were to go up to Saul, hey, I want to try and make peace here. What would Saul do? Nah, let's just kill you now. <laughs> it's all over. He can't do it. Jonathan can. The reason that Jonathan can is because he has a good rep uh, representation with his father and a good one with David. If you're going to be a peacemaker, you have to have a good relationship with both parties. If you do not have a good relationship with both parties, it's not going to work. You won't be able to be a peacemaker in that situation. That's all right. God has other people who can. So there's a, there's a problem here. Saul is openly speaking about wanting to kill David. Now, how many of you all know the word of God is pretty clear, thou shalt do no murder? That's what it says. The Bible does say thou shalt not kill. It does not say that. Go back and look at it. You can, you can check it out. It says, literal Hebrew, thou shalt do no murder. If it was thou shalt kill, how many times does God tell people to disobey that? How many kings of Israel were commissioned to wipe out certain people? How many times did God say, say I want you to go in and you need to kill them all? Judgment is coming down upon them. You need to kill them all. How many times did God himself kill people when he opened up the ground and swallowed them up? The Bible does not say, thou shalt not kill. See, this is the tactic of the enemy. He always wants to confuse what God said so that therefore he can pervert the end result. God did not say, thou shalt not kill. He said, thou shalt do no murder. So, here we have Saul, and he's openly wanting to murder, not just kill, murder David. Now, he's wrong, but he's the king. The king sets the rules. God warned him about that, and uh, they said, we want a king anyway. Now, being a peacemaker, this might help you out. Being a peacemaker does not mean you cannot see the wrong on one side. Or judge one side to need protection. Jonathan is the peacemaker. He is the guy who sits in the spot and says, Hey, <laughs> Dad's wrong. David's right in this situation. He, he can do that. He's the peacemaker. Just because you're a peacemaker doesn't mean you have to make everybody happy. That is not the role of the peacemaker. You may help one side more. But if you treat the other side as the enemy, your ability to bring peace will be compromised. You cannot look at the other side as the enemy. You cannot think words about the other side being the enemy. You cannot speak words about the other side being the enemy. You will be disqualified from being the peacemaker. Now, before we go on this, let me just ask you a question. How many people are in a situation right now where you can or need peace? You can either bring it or you need to... Is, this is that we got to find out what the Word of God teaches us, how we can do it. Because a lot of times, we're doing it wrong. And then we throw up our arms, well, I can't bring peace into this situation. You can. You can bring peace into this situation. <clears throat> we're going to find out here, though, that the peacemaker does eventually give up. We'll see why. Now, Jonathan needs to be mature. And you need to be mature, have a certain amount of maturity about you in order to be a peacemaker because, number one, you've got to keep your emotions under control. If you let your emotions hang out there, you're not going to be able to bring much peace because you're not going to be calm <laughs> and you're not going to be able to see clearly. Verse 4, Then thus Jonathan spoke well of David to his father and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you and because his works have been very good towards you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood? See, he's calling them out. You're sinning by doing this. To kill David without a cause. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and, <clears throat> and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David. Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in time past. We can learn some things from here. This is the successful attempt that Jonathan did to bring peace into a situation in which one side wanted the other person dead. Now, all you folks who raised your hand about needing peace in a situation, how many in no situation does somebody want to kill the other person? 
All right. Not, I don't see any hands raised on that one. So your situation is as bad as this one. So if, it, if these principles will work here, then it will work in your life too. So Jonathan has been successful here, bringing peace into this situation. <clears throat> now this involved, in order to bring peace in this situation, he needed to get both sides to feel at ease and safe with each other. This is generally why peace is disrupted. disrupted. Each party, or at least one of the parties, each party would feel threatened in some way. Saul thought that David was against him and trying to take his kingdom. David, that Saul was wanting to harm or to kill him. Now, David was right. He did want to do that. But if you're going to be a peacemaker, what you need to understand is what is causing the threat. It doesn't matter if the threat is real. You cannot help a per person if you're just going to sit in there and say, oh, that's not true, that's not right. See, Jonathan doesn't say, look, David doesn't want to do, do you any harm. No, he goes back and says, look, look at David's record. He put his life on the line and killed the Philistine. He put his life on the line and goes, and he goes out to war to, to fight for the enemies of Israel. And he probably listed some other things that David has done. David has, has helped Saul calm him down, calm down that spirit that was on him. He's helped him a lot. David has done nothing but help you here. So he's giving them examples. He's not just telling them, oh, there's no, there's no big deal with that. No, he's giving them examples in it. And this is what you're going to have to do. You've got to find out why does this person feel threatened. When you have a situation between a husband and a wife, somehow one or both of them is feeling threatened. When you have a situation between a parent and a child, somehow one or both are feeling threatened. There's a threat there. It may just be a simple thing. I'm feeling like the relationship is going to be severed. That's a threat. I don't want that. That's a threat. All kinds of things can come in. You've got to find out what is the threat. What is it that is causing the person to feel unsafe or like they're going to lose something? Once you find that out, then you can get to where you can resolve it. And so he asked uh, some things of his father. He presents some things to his father to help this out. Verse 8, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled before him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night, so also, Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Now, sometimes when a peace is established, there was peace between David and Saul. Jonathan had made the peace. Maybe some of you can relate to this. Have you ever brought peace between some parties only to find out they're fighting again? <laughs> they're at it again. Something disrupted the peace. This is what happened here. Something disrupted the peace. Now we look at what has happened with David. David went out and brought a great victory back for Israel. Then he comes back from that and he plays his harp for the king. I don't know, if you've got a guy who's, who's that instrumental in war, I don't see why you have him on the harp. Or he ought to get somebody else on harp duty. But David was willing and David came in he did, did harp duty. And so Saul's got a spear in his hand and he gets so distressed he's ready to kill David. Something has stirred him up. And do understand this, in some of the situations that you are in, there can be spiritual forces behind stirring up one side. You may have to be praying about that, taking authority in that situation, whatever it might be, but we know that in this particular situation, there was a spiritual force that was behind it, and he had a spear. Now, later on in the story, we're going to see that, that Saul is going to throw the spear. This word here is not throw, it's drive. He kept the spear in his hand, and he is physically throwing that spear, holding on to it the whole time, against, the, the, against David, and he hits the wall. He's trying to hit David. He's not throwing at him from across the room. He is right up next to David with the spear. Spear is long, it's not a sword. And he is thrusting this thing to try and get David. Now, if you were David, how many of you are hanging around? Yep. See, that's the problem. Some Christians would do it. 
some Christians feel like, well, I just got to see the best in him. No, he's trying to kill you. Get out. Leave. Don't be staying in that situation. That's, uh, that's bad news. So he, he gets on home. They uh, make this plan. His wife tells him, you need to get out of here. He's going to kill you. I know my dad. <laughs> she, she's his daughter. I know my dad. When he gets this mad, I mean, it's, it's bad news. You need to get out of here. He's going to try and kill you. Now, whenever, whenever I have a, a problem, whenever I have a problem, I always like to go to the Word of God and say, who had this problem in the Word of God? And then I like to take a look at how they handled it. Now, you have to be careful with that method. Because there are some people in the Word of God whose behavior you should not copy. You should not emulate it. And you can figure that out by taking a look at what people did compared to what the Word teaches. There are sometimes people did things very much against what the Word of God teaches. That's not the Word of God saying, go ahead and do it. The Word of God is saying, they didn't do it the way we said, and that's probably why they had some of the results or and, uh, why the story ended up the way that it was. Don't just look at, well, somebody did it in the Bible, so I guess I can go out there and do it. No. That's not what we're supposed to do. So, this is one person. Don't emulate her. She's not a good person to emulate. I really find absolutely nothing good about this woman to emulate from the, what we he, hear in the, in the Scriptures. Maybe outside of the Scriptures, there's parts that are not recorded. Maybe there was something good. But what we have recorded of Michal, nothing. So um, we'll go on. Verse 18. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is, in, is at Naoth in Ramah. Now we told you last week that David had a special relationship with Samuel. It wasn't just that Samuel came in and anointed him and that was it. And uh, last week's story when we saw Abigail... We saw that David had gone into the wilderness after he got the news that Samuel died. That, that affected David. This is somebody very close. This is the first person in David's life who believed in him. As far as we know, first person recorded in Scripture that believed in David. His parents didn't. Maybe his mom did. We don't have much record about her. But his father didn't. His brothers didn't. The people around him didn't. No one seemed to give him the time of day. He's out there doing a job nobody else wants to do. And nobody thinks he's worthwhile. But Samuel did. And when Samuel dies, it had a great effect on David. And he went into the wilderness, and that started our story last week. But here we see that he's getting with Samuel. He's got his, his life is threatened, his well-being. He's, he's uh, chased out of his home. He's chased away from all his stuff. He's got to start over again, and he comes over to Samuel. Because uh, I know Samuel will help. I know Samuel will speak good words. And so he comes over there, and Samuel sees... What's going on? He says, Yo, you and me, let's go over here. Let's spend some time together. Let's, uh, let's get over this. And so they go to a place, and they're hanging out there. Messages were sent to Saul where David was. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Now we're looking at two whole chapters here. I love details in Scripture, and we have taught this. Well, last year we went over some of this and looked at Saul. We're looking at Jonathan. So I have to skip by a lot of details. But, but just know this, this way. If you come to mess with the prophet, and you are of the wrong spirit, if you come on his territory, God has every right to, to throw his good spirit on you and just mess with you. <laughs> Apparently, that's what he did there. Everybody who came out there, they just start prophesying. They just start saying... Uh, the Spirit of God came upon them. And so every time they sent messengers out there to get David, well, they can't get David because they're over there prophesying. We could get into why that was and all this stuff, but then we'd get distracted and not finish up what we're going to do here. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers. And they prophesied likewise. Now this is before the days of computers. And I say that for this reason. If something doesn't work on your computer, what do you do? Exactly the same thing. Isn't that right? If you boot up your computer and it does not come up, what do you do? Shut it down and boot it up again. If a second time it fails, what do you do? 
shut it down, and boot it up again. Why? Because <laughs> sometimes that fixes it. It does, for, it does for computers. Most other things, if you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. But computers, it doesn't seem to be that way. It just seems to, you know, try it again. Oh, it works now. All right. But here, this is, Saul is trying to reboot a computer. It didn't work the first time. Well, let's send other people. And I don't know, we don't have this detail, but I kind of think Saul must have been, let's find some more diabolical people. Because Saul's an evil, diabolical person. He attracts evil, diabolical people. We need to get more, pe more messengers that are more evil and diabolical than the, than the other ones. Let's send them. I kind of think that one. We'll have to wait to get to heaven and watch the videotape to see. But I kind of think he, uh, he got some people who would not be very qualified to prophesy. And he sent them. Can't tell you for sure if that, that's the way it was, but he sent them. And they prophesied likewise, it said. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. So he did it three times the same way. Then he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And so he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied, that's his kingly garments, and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and laid down naked, that's without his kingly garments, all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, this happened back in chapter 10 as well. Again, we're not here to look at Saul. We're looking at Jonathan. So let's keep him going. Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? Jonathan, what's going on here? Why does your dad want to kill me? So Jonathan said to him, by no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing either great or small without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Now, could Jonathan truthfully say this with the events that have gone on so far? No. I mean, Saul just tried to take his spear and drive it into David. So this tells us something. Jonathan was not there. Jonathan was out fighting Philistines because he was a leader. He had men under him and he would go, he was out fighting Philistines. Then David must have known where he was being that closely tied in the army and left where he was to go somewhere near where Jonathan was and he got a hold of Jonathan. Jonathan doesn't know what has just transpired. He knows, hey, we made peace. My father said he has sworn he won't do you any harm. That's what he's working off of. He's not being two-faced. He's not being dishonest. Very likely he doesn't know. He wasn't there. So Jonathan said, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing either great or small without first telling me. He has the confidence that, hey, if my dad's going to do something, he is going to let me know. So David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Now it is easier for one who desires or attempts to be a peacemaker to believe one or both sides are better than they truly are. That's easy to do. If you are going to be a peacemaker or if you have a peacemaker in your life, more than likely, because of the things that are necessary out of that peacemaker, they are going to believe that you are better than you are and that the side that is against you is better than they are. You kind of have to do that. So Jonathan believes his father is better than he is. So Jonathan says to David, Whatever you, yourself, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. So he says, David, look, I am, if, if I knew my father was out to get you, if I knew something was going, I would tell you. I would let you know. And David says, no, he's not telling you about this because he knows we have a good relationship. He doesn't want to let you know. So you've been kept in the dark about this. And so he says, well, David, if that's true, tell me what you want me to do. Tell me, what, tell me what's going on here. 
what would you like me to do to fix this? And David said to Jonathan, Indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. But let me go that I may hide in, my, in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If, thus, if he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But he is very angry. Be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? But Jonathan said, Far be it from you. For if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then I would, not, would I not tell you. When you are a peacekeeper, when you are operating that, it does not mean you have to keep sitting. You ought to let people know if you're trying to make peace. Look, what you're telling me here, this is crucial information, and I've got to tell the other side. I've got to let them know that this is what's going on. I don't want you to. Do you want peace? I want peace. But I don't want them to know this. You're going to have to have that out with them. And you're going to have to come to a place where you decide, look, I'm not here to keep secrets. I'll keep something if it's, if it's, if it's not important. But this is important to the process. And they've got to know that this is going on. Don't be afraid to be frank. Don't be afraid to be up front and to let people know. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to, to get things done like you want to get them done. People like Saul. You have people like Saul in your life. And people like Saul will keep the truth from you if they think that sharing it will undermine their purpose. Just understand, that's out there. You are going to be trying to bring peace in the situations that folks are not telling you everything you need to know. That's all right. You got God on your side. The Spirit of God is going to let you know, hey, there's something else going on there. <laughs> you need to press in and find out what it is. Or he may even just tell you what it is. But you'll at least know, no, nope, you know, there's something else. I'm, I'm missing something here. Go back to the story with Samuel and David. And uh, he comes in to, to anoint the king. He goes over all the sons and God says, no. Do you have any more sons? Did you, did you forget one? Why? Because the Spirit of God is telling him, you don't have all the sons. And you, something's missing here. And so he goes to, goes to uh, Saul, or goes to his father, David's father. You know, you got any more? Jesse, is there any more boys out there that you missed one? God will tell you. He may not tell you the, the son's name. He may not tell you what's going, going on, but he'll let you know. There's something more. Press in. Press in. You've got to have that trust. You've got to have that faith in him. And go forward with it. Now understand that like-minded people will undermine relationships regardless of how close they may have been in order to accomplish their dark purpose. There are people in your life. There are people where you work like Saul. There are people in your family like Saul. That one's easier to believe in. <laughs> it's good to see. It's good to see folks over here, families that like each other. That's all right. Because sometimes you get around people and then there's families they don't like each other. No, our family's tiny. You know, my wife, we get into her family. I mean, they can fill up whole hotels. <laughs> you know, we, my family, you know, we'd be looking at a, a two-room hotel room or something like that. <laughs> we don't need a whole lot. Not a whole lot of family there. But um, no matter how big or small it is, there can be problems and all you need is one person to come in with his attitude and boy they can disrupt some things don't you dare feel despair because you have light on your side that's what the enemy wants he wants David to feel despair because I got this evil guy with all this power coming at you but God's got a way dark purposes are willing to sacrifice any relationship with little or no remorse. If a person has a dark purpose, they will sacrifice any relationship in order to get their purpose. They do not care what relationship it will be. But godly purposes, they will reluctantly put a relationship on the altar, but it will affect them. There's a, that's a big difference you can see right there between godly purposes and dark purposes. Dark purposes 
will sever a relationship with you at a drop of a hat because I want my purpose. But godly people, look, I love you and I want to continue having a relationship with you but if you keep doing this or you keep going this way, we will cut it off. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, but I'm willing. See, that's the difference. If you just look for that one attitude, you can find the difference between a dark purpose and a godly purpose. Now, there are fleshly purposes as well. Fleshly purposes will sever some relationships, but there's a line drawn on others. Now, I'll go this far, but no further for a fleshly purpose. This is simply because I'm not sold out to the cause or the calling. Just trying to get what I want. Their flesh. Just trying to get what they want. I want this, but I also want this over here. So I'm not willing to cut this off completely to go up to here. So there are some fleshly purposes out there, but the ones that are really messing you up are the dark ones. And you've got to come after them with the Spirit of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's what the Word of God says, right? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me, or what if your father answers you roughly? Then Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out to the field. So both of them went out into the field, and Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow, or the third day, and indeed there is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you. May the Lord do so much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying that the Lord required at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone of Zell. Then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if he... But if I say thus to the young man, Look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed the Lord be between you and me forever. Then David hid in the field, and when the new moon had come, the king sat down to, the, to eat the feast. Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on the seat by the wall. And Jonathan rose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place, was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He is unclean. Surely he is unclean. See, this day, when nothing is said, no explanation is given, we just see that David's seat is empty, gives Saul the opportunity to begin to think about some things. He's thinking. Right, why is he not here? What could be the reasons? What are the reasons that he's, he's trying to come up with some reasons? Well, he's, maybe he's just unclean. He'll come in tomorrow. Now, David may also be thinking words like, like this about, about Saul. Oh, I bet about now Jonathan's finding out that Saul wants to kill me. He could be thinking all these kind of words too. They're both thinking words. But understand this. The word you think toward your spouse, children, boss, co-workers, friends, enemies, etc. will put you in a mindset of a maker of a peace or one of trouble. It's the words that go around in your head. You've got to be careful of those words. Husband and wife have a, have a fight and they go off. What's going on in the head? Well, that woman that thou hast given me. Right? <laughs> My life would be great if it wasn't for her. And we just start going over all this. We're, we're, we're going over. We're having words. Sometimes we even speak them out of our mouth. Those are the words that cause you to be a troublemaker and not a peacemaker. You've got to get rid of those words. You cannot be meditating on those words all the time. If you keep meditating on those words, well, that son of mine, well, that daughter of mine, well, that's so, so, well, if you keep going over all those words and thinking them, that's not going to help you. If you go to work and you're thinking the whole time, I'll bet so-and-so is just going to do this, I can expect this, and you can start talking like this, you are setting the stage 
for wrong things to happen, bad things to go on. You've got to set the stage differently. You've got to, it, your words are important. The words that you think, the words that you speak, these are important. I don't think it was, wasn't too long ago I, I told you the, the stories. When, when I learned a lot of these things, I hadn't gone to Rainbow yet. I was, just came out of the King's College, and I took over the park down in Willow Grove. Remember the park story I told you about? I went on down there, and I saw that park was a, it was a hotbed. They had the two gangs in there. They had the black gang over here playing basketball. We had the white gang up here doing the drugs. <laughs> I don't like the white gang. I wanted them to get out of my park. <laughs> didn't want that kind of stuff going on. But anyway, we had to bring peace into that situation. And uh, I'm not bringing peace by going into work. I can't believe I have to go into work. can't believe I have to do all that. I didn't go into work thinking nasty things. I went into work, and I was out of my mouth. I would speak words, there was going to be peace in this park. There was not going to be war. There was not going to be fighting. It didn't happen every day. I told you I had stones thrown at me. I had people falling back into the pavilion ready to, to pummel me. <laughs> I had stuff going on. But I did get the chief of police who showed up at the park and said I had to come on down here to see what was going on because we have not been called. <laughs> we have never had a summer we're not been called. We have not been called to come down to this park. I said, no, everything's fine down here. Everything's good. But you see, every time I walk around the park, I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm speaking out over that thing. I'm talking to it. There is peace in this park. And I spoke words this way. I thought words of, of peace. I didn't even know all I knew from the Word. I just knew to do it. And so I was doing that. We had peace in that park. We had good things that were going on. So you can have peace in your situations, but not if you keep thinking these evil words. Not if you keep going into work. My boss, he just... He just has it out for me. Oh, my boss. No, you've got to start speaking to some different words. That doesn't mean be ignorant what they're doing. Does not mean to be ignorant. Word, word of God says, harmless as doves, wise as serpents. <laughs> you make sure you, you, you keep an eye on them. Understand, there are people at work that are out to get you. That's not paranoid. <laughs> That's probably just true. That's all right. God's going to help you to get in a place where they don't get you. But you just got to listen to them. They were out to get Jesus with a whole lot more than what they're out to get you at, at work for. So Jonathan's got to go into this. He's got to be thinking good things about his dad, the good things about David. He's got to stay objective. If he starts thinking nasty things about his dad and good things about David, he's not going to be objective anymore. He's got to keep that, uh, that objective spot. Make sure that your words to your spouse, children, boss, co-workers, friends, enemies, whatever. <laughs> Whoever it is, even your dog. We don't count cats, but you know dogs are right. I mean, there is no peace with a cat, is there? If the cat wants to be at peace, he's at peace with you. If not, it's over. They do their own thing. These are, I think, the only blanks I really gave you. Trouble doesn't always just find people. Sometimes we pave the way. Sometimes we pave the way. We pave the way by thinking the thoughts that we're thinking, by speaking the words that we're speaking. Wives, if you get over with your girlfriends, and you start talking about your husband. I can't believe he did. And, and then he did this. And So you are paving the way for failure. Now, I didn't just find you. You paved the way. Husbands, you get along with your guys and you start talking about how nasty your wife is. How mean she is. Whatever it might be. You are paving the way for failure. If you get amongst other co-workers and the boss in the, in the area and start talking about the boss about how mean he is. You are paving the way for for failure. Knock it off. Don't make the devil's job easier. Make it harder. Start speaking words. Good words. Father God, I thank you that my boss flows in supernatural wisdom of how to operate this company. Of how to handle the employees. Of how to handle these situations. I thank you that you will give him solutions because it matters to me. And you just start speaking words like that. You're going to be messing up where the devil wants you to pave 
the way forward. Don't let them do it. So, verse 27. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? Doesn't even say his name, apparently. Now, what day do you think this would all come down on? Jonathan and David. Do you remember? They thought on the third day it would come down. But it came down on the second day. Saul is that angry. He's ready to move on this thing. Second day. Why hasn't he come on, on over? So Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission to me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family as a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore he has not come to the king's table. Now say the older brother in the situation would have certain authority in the family. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Now, surely no one here, but other people in other families in other cities, far, far away. <laughs> if you've ever heard of anybody who has said, uh, come up and uh, a father who has said nasty things about the birth origins of their son, they are not following a godly example, they're following Saul. Don't do it. This is not something that, that we should do. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had threatened him shamefully. So he cast a spear. The other time he kept it in his hand. He's ready to drive it through him. This time he throws it at Jonathan. Jonathan's got a little bit more time to get away. What he did against David was of a higher degree than what he did against Jonathan. That's what I just want you to see. Um, still, fathers should not be throwing spears at their son. <laughs> it's not a good idea. And Jonathan is mad. I don't know if that was, if you were Jonathan, how many would have gotten more than just mad? And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. Then he said to his lad, Now run, find the arrows which I shoot. And the lad ran. He shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the lad and said to him, Go carry them to the city. As soon as the lad had gone, David arose from the place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, and bowed down three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Now, does anyone think that was an awful elaborate way to pass on a message that you ended up seeing the guy anyway? I've thought about this for, for a while. Why in the world go through all this elaborate stuff? Why not just go out there and tell him? You know where he is. He met you at the field that you, you had the other incident on. Just going out there and tell him. Jonathan fully expects restitution. Fully expects it. He doesn't just think his father means no ill. He believes his father means no ill. He needs to go out there, shoot the arrows, call the lad back, and that they both head on back into the city. But something happened. And it's not going the way that he went. So what he does is he sets up this situation. He fires these arrows out. And I guess they're, they're poor kings. I don't know. And they decide to conserve on the arrows. And so he sends the lad out to go get the arrows. And when he gets out to where it is, he hollers out to him, go beyond. That's the signal to let David know. 
Now, I'm sure the lad is thinking, they're, they're right here. Because he waits to say it until the lad gets up to the, where they, they are. He knows where they are. He's on the place. And he says, aren't they beyond you? Uh, no, uh, they're right here. But we're not going to rebuke the king's son. We're just going to go around, clean up the arrows. And then when you get on back there, he says, look, take all this stuff back. And he goes on over because this is what I want you to see here. Jonathan is willing to sacrifice his relationship with David because he has a greater purpose in mind. His purpose is not dark. His purpose is greater. He loves David. David is probably the closest person to him in all the kingdom. He's probably the most like-minded person in all the kingdom. He loves David. He doesn't want to lose his friend. But he knows if I don't send you away, your life is in danger. And he reluctantly severs the relationship between him and David. You go your way. I have to stay here. But you go your way. And they weep and they're sad. And they make vows together. And then they separate. Dark purposes, godly purposes, and flesh purposes. When you have a godly purpose, you will sever relationships but at great expense. And you will feel it. But when you have a dark purpose, you will cut off people and not even bat an eyelash. That's one way that you can tell. It's not the only place it is in the Word of God, but it's the place we are here today. Now, hopefully I left some time here. I really want to spend time on this. Plus, we've got a great cliffhanger for you. I don't want to forget that. A peacemaker is identifiable because first they have maturity like one. They have actions like one. There are certain ways that, that um, people that are peacemakers, they will act. They have to have a certain amount of maturity. There are certain actions they will have. There are thoughts that a peacemaker will have. If you constantly have thoughts that are thinking why someone is wrong, why someone is of poor character, why someone is bringing so much difficulty in your life, why someone, if they were just out of your life, your life would be better. If you're thinking that, you are not having thoughts of a peacemaker. You are not a peacemaker. And anything in the Word of God that blesses a peacemaker is not for you. <laughs> Good news is you can be one. You've got to change it, though. A peacemaker is going to have maturity. It's going to have actions. It's going to have thoughts. It's going to speak words like one. They're going to seek solutions like one. You cannot, as a peacemaker, just look for a middle ground. Can you imagine if Jonathan is trying to get a middle ground? All right, let's take a look at this. Saul, dead, you want to kill him. David, you want to stay alive. Heaven, mm -hmm. if we reach the middle ground and you just cut off one of his arms. That's not, that's not acceptable, is it? You cannot, as a peacemaker, just look for middle ground. You've got to find something that is sustainable, something that can be maintained, something that both sides can stay with. Can't just be a middle ground. Each side is going to make requests, and some of those requests are going to be ridiculous. And as a peacemaker, you say, really? <laughs> I mean, that's what you want? You know that's not going to happen. Be realistic. Give me a realistic request and we'll try and make this happen. Sometimes you got to call people on things if you're going to be a peacemaker. And the last one, you are not moved by emotions. You've got to be not moved by emotions like a peacemaker. Peacemaker can't be moved by emotions. You're not going to be, be doing those things. That's why there are more people stirring up strife than there are stirring up peace. It is a whole lot easier to be a strife stirrer upper than a peacemaker. In fact, a lot of Christians are real good at it. You need to knock it off. Now, many Christians desire to be seen as a peacemaker, but I'll bet you God's view is a little bit different. Just because you pray for peace doesn't mean you are seeking it. Now, do not raise your hand. Use your inside hand. We all know what inside hands are. No one else can see them. If you are involved in a situation in which you are praying for peace, Praying for things to come to a, to a, good, uh, a good conclusion. Praying for, for peace. Praying for something to be sustained there. 
but you have words that are contrary, your prayers are useless. It's kind of like uh, the people, you know, they believe God. Well, I'm believing God for this. Well, how's that going? Well, I don't, I don't have, well, it's not changed. Word of God says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men barely. Oh, no, it's not barely? What is it? Liberally. Gives to all men liberally. liberally. So if you ask God for wisdom, we've used this example before, you'll know it. If you ask God for wisdom, God, I need wisdom in a situation. How many people need wisdom from God on a situation, work, home, wherever it might be? You ask God, God, I need wisdom in a situation. You pray to God, God, grant me wisdom. And so then you go out from there and somebody says, what are you going to do about that? Oh, I don't know. It's keeping me up at night. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, I'm so stressed over this whole thing. I know I've got to make a decision, but I just don't know what to do. I asked God. He hasn't told me anything yet. You have just undermined everything you just did to ask, ask God for. I mean, knock it off. If you ask God for wisdom, then walk in that. What are you going to do? I don't know. And just smile. I don't know. I don't need to know yet. When I need to know, God will make sure that I know. And I'll do it. I'll obey. Trust him. Trust him. Yeah, sure, sometimes God comes in just with a nick of time with that little bit of wisdom. That's okay. You're just working on trust. Better to learn trust at this level than when you need it later on. Like with David's example. It's better to learn how to slay bears and lions so that when a giant comes by, you're ready to slay them. Get ready for the small stuff so you're ready for the big things. If you pray for peace, but you speak contrary words, you aren't seeking it. If you think contrary thoughts, you're not seeking peace. If you do contrary things, you are not seeking peace. If you pursue one-sided solutions, you are not seeking peace. Be a peacemaker. It's better. Jonathan had good thoughts about his dad. He had good thoughts about David. He spoke well of both. He stood up to the evil in his dad when it rose up. He assumed good, but would rebuke injustice when it was exposed. He looked for solutions that would work for both. He went along with a plan to expose dishonesty. Anybody ever devised a plan at work to expose dishonesty? Do not think that you're missing God by doing it. God can give you a plan to expose dishonesty. God is all about what is dishonest being exposed. We had a situation like that one time in a, in a church I was at with a person who was in a position for a long time. Long, long time. I may have been before I was born. No, it wasn't quite that long, but it was a long time in that position. And it was a very, uh, very public position in the church. And uh, they used this uh, as a way to gain favor with the people in the church. But this person was underhandedly undoing many of the things in the church and made her own decisions on things that she was not supposed to make decisions on. And I came in, and they put me in as the assistant pastor, and I saw this kind of stuff going on. And I, I was bringing it up to the people who, uh, who were there. Look, this is what's going on. This, this can't be happening. Pastor says it's supposed to be this way, and this person goes out and does it this way. And so what we did was we set up a plan to expose her. And we gave her something to do that we knew would be very prominent. And I, I knew if we give her this to do, she will alter it, she will change it. And she did. And the entire people, all the people that were there, everyone saw what was done. This has been going on? Yep. And in Removal happened. It was not easy. It was, it was not, not good. But it would have been a whole lot worse if we just kept it going. See, you can, God will give you plans. Now, you don't make that person do something evil. If you put together a plan to cause someone to do something evil, you are wrong. But if you put together a plan to expose evil that is already there, that's fine. That's all right. God will even give you wisdom on it. God gave David wisdom. Look, let's do it this way. We got the feast coming up. If I'm not there, if there's evil in him, it's going to stir up on the inside and he won't be able to stay quiet about it. He may stay quiet for a day. He's not staying quiet for three days. He's going to say something and something's going to come out. And sure enough, it did. 
There are people who are devising evil plans against you. God knows about it. And God will give you the ability to expose them. He'll tell you what to do. And just follow it. And, well, I'm deceiving. No, you're not. Just because you are not giving all the information about a situation to somebody does not mean you are deceiving. Did Jesus ever keep information from people? <laughs> Did he ever teach things so that people would not hear it? Did he not say that his purpose was so that they would not get it? Well, then do like Jesus does. That's all. They have not shown themselves worthy to receive that. Now, if they go through this and they don't, no darkness is exposed, then maybe you come to clarity. Oh, that's not there. I thought it was there. It apparently is not. And then you can change. But that's fine. We don't have time for all this. I got to keep going. <laughs> so anyway, if you got some people evil in your life trying to expose something, because some, unless something gets exposed, you don't get to deal with it. God loves things being exposed and brought to light because then we can deal with it, fix it up, make it better. There are five to be done's to achieve peace. Five things you need to do if you want to bring peace into a situation. First off, discover threats. That's the number one thing you've got to do. You've got to discover the threats. You've got to find out what causes people to feel threatened in these situations. What is causing them to, to, to have that? And, uh, you know, Mia's back there. Mia likes to work with dogs. Still working with dogs? Not, not as much. But when you're working with dogs, and she would bring in a lot of dogs that were from rescues or from other situations, she don't know what the situations were they came from. Anybody ever seen a rescue dog? You don't know what their background was. And so sometimes when you come up to a rescue dog, they get a little jittery. They're, they're a little antsy. Why? Because they're not sure if you're not a threat. You don't know all the things that went on, but what you've got to do is establish, I'm not a threat. And get them to that, that place. Once you can establish that, then you, you can make headway with the dog. The same way, folks, with us, you've got to find out what are the threats. I, it doesn't matter if they're real. That dog's afraid of you. The threat's not real. You don't mean any harm, but the dog doesn't know that. You've got to get to that place where you... Well, you can show them it's not a real threat. We can, we can get by here. You've got to discover the threats. What does each person feel threatened by? People that are acting against you. What are they feeling threatened by? What is it about you that is causing them to feel threatened? If you don't discover and resolve the threat, you won't be able to bring peace. I don't care how much you pray for it. And I don't care how much you speak to it. You've got to resolve that threat. You've got to take that threat away. One or all parties may, may not know what threatens them. So you have to have some patience. Just because they feel threatened doesn't mean they know what it is. <laughs> little kids, maybe you were little once, right? How many people were felt threatened by something in the room? Big monster is going to come in. Bad guy is going to come in. Something's under the bed. It is amazing that all you got to do is turn the lights on and those mysterious monsters are now powerless. Isn't it amazing? Little kids, you think that? Big monsters. There's a monster underneath my bed. But if you turn the light off, they're paralyzed. They can't do nothing. <laughs> That's not a, a legitimate threat. But you as a parent have to deal with that, don't you? You've got to get, get that person to feel not threatened by the dark not threatened by things they don't see. That's what you got to do in these situations too. It shows a great need to be mature and to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will speak to you about some, some of the things that they feel threatened by. But keep your emotions out of the process. Stay subject to your spirit. That's the, that's the thing that you need to do. So first off, discover the threat. Second, reveal what is wrong. Reveal what you see is wrong or unjust. You've got to reveal it. Just because you see it doesn't do any good to keep it to yourself. I've got to get out there and say, look, you feel threatened. You, this is what's going on. You've got to reveal it. If you get it inside, if God speaks it to you or you see it, you've got to get out there and, and speak it. Jonathan approached his dad this way. You've got to 
You got to do that. Speak it out. Do not think you're going to be a peacemaker and keep all this nice information in the, on the inside. If you do that, you're only going to impede the process. If you get your flesh involved, if you get your flesh feelings involved, you will impede the process. Keep those emotions in check. Here's number three. Find sustainable solutions. You need to find a solution that both people will say, yeah, we can do that. Yep, we can, uh, we can get that taken care of. Learn what is unknown. Weed out the untruths. There's sometimes people feel threatened by what they don't know. You've got to weed that out. You've got to learn those things. Weed out the untruths. Sometimes, how many, have you had people in your life who believed something that was untrue about you? And what they believed was a hindrance in you getting along with them. It's not true. You've got to find a way to get them to understand that's not true. I'm not after your job. I'm not trying to get this from you. I'm not trying to do this to you. You've got to find a way, first off, to discover what it is. Then you've got to get in there and, and undo some of the untruths that they have. Find sustainable solutions. If you don't find all the things they believe to be true that are untrue, if you don't find them, you may have developed a solution that no one can sustain. Because not everybody will be real honest with you. They may sit there and say, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And inside they say, I can't even do that tomorrow. I'll be done. I can't even do that throughout the day. Nope, there's not going to happen. But they're outside, they're saying, yep, 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 we can do that. <laughs> you got to find a sustainable solution. Four Consistent speech and thoughts. You've got to be thinking good thoughts about the situation. You've got to have your speech under control. You've got to speak and think words of peace. Contrary words will undermine the process. There are many enemies to this. Don't be giving them any voice. Don't be paving the way for them. Have speech consistent. Get those other people that you're working with. Get them to do it too. Now, there's one other verse important ingredient of a peacemaker and it is not jumping out at you here in this story it's here but it won't jump out at you so next week we're going to take a look at another story someone who as I was looking up you know I like to to read over all the history I can on these stories to find out as much I don't bring nearly all of it out to you but I, I I like to look it up and when I was looking up one of these things someone made mention of a particular person who was a great peacemaker. When they said it, I almost, my jaw hit the... <laughs> who? Who? You, you mean, no. And so they were adamant about it. This person is a great peacemaker. I said, there's no way this person is a peacemaker. So I went back to the story. And I read the story. And I said, that person is wrong. This person is not a peacemaker. But there was a peacemaker in the story. It's a little tiny blip. And when I saw it, that's where the peace came from. Ah, if you want to find out what that is, that's next week because we're going to need a whole, whole time on it. I told you you're going to hate me at the end. <laughs> I, I don't often warn you about a cliffhanger, but I knew I had at least warned you about that one. But I'll tell you what, if you were in a situation and you are wondering, how can I bring peace into this situation? Everybody, it seems, is just, they're just against me. And you may have heard this Christian principle taught in many churches for centuries that you basically need to be a doormat and let people walk over you in order to have peace. That it's more important that there's peace in the situation and you just give it everything. Have you ever heard that? You know, just give Whatever they ask of you, just give it. Just go ahead and do it. Just go along. You're the stronger person. You're the, you're the Christian. You should just go along. If they want to make unreasonable requests, you just go ahead and do it. If they want to slap you on the cheek, turn the other one. <laughs> I love what one preacher said. <laughs> I, love, I love what one preacher said about this. He said, the Bible tells me, you know, if you slap my cheek to turn you the other one, it says nothing about what to do if you hit that one. <laughs> but we're going to take a look at this 
I want you to see there is a key ingredient in dealing with these people, and for the most part, we have dealt with them wrong, which is why these situations have hung around, stayed around. We don't have peace in these situations. We're at odds at work. We're on edge in different places because I think i got to let these people walk all over me. i just got to take the stuff that they dish out because there needs to be peace. Remember one of the, one of the four to-dos? Find a sustainable solution. You getting walked on is not sustainable. You can only endure it for so long, and then it's over. You need to find a sustainable solution. So, we're going to take a look at the story next week. I'm curious to find out if anyone can figure out what it is. I tried to be vague. <laughs> tried to be vague. But there is a story that will, when you see it, just, oh, I see it. There it, it is so glaring when I saw it. There's the peacemaker. And if you can capture what this peacemaker has done, you will take your situations where you have been walked on and you'll be able to turn them around and not be walked on anymore. Anybody, anybody interested in that? Yeah. Appreciate both of you. <laughs> well, we'll get into that next week and we'll, we'll be able to spend some time with it. Would you all stand up with me? Being called to a peacemaker is not something that is for a select few. God has put it out to everybody because he knows most people are going to cause strife. Most people are going to cause trouble. Most people are, going to, uh, are, are not going to help situations. You can think about this at work. At work, how many people have way more strife generators than peacemakers? Way more. It's so easy to generate strife. It takes a lot to generate peace. But God is looking for peacemakers. Could you imagine if the entire body of Christ was out making peace? Whew. That'd be a whole lot different. But we're not. A whole lot of us, we are fighting for this doctrine. We're fighting for this way of looking at things. We're fighting for this right. We're fighting for this bit of power. We're fighting for all kinds of things. We don't need to. We need to learn what is a peacemaker. There are certain things that Paul stood up and fought for. There are certain things that Peter stood up and fought for. There are certain things Jesus stood up and fought for. But there's other ones. We just let that go. We need to have the wisdom that they walked in. And if they walked in it, we can walk in it. This morning is our Communion Sunday. We have our Communion elements out there. The rushers are going to be bringing them around to you. Because the best example of the peacemaker we have is Jesus, who came to this earth to live life victorious over sin so that he could go to the cross. And at the cross, pay the price so that we could have reconciliation, that we could have peace with God. We could have peace with God. Glory to God. Our ushers will be coming and bringing those, those elements over here. And when they do, the Word of God tells us, as often as we do this, to do it in remembrance of Him. We ought to remember what it is that He did for us. He did something that was very self sacrificing that self-sacrificing on his part. He lived all those years away from God. And at the cross, he had a separation between him and God. It had never happened. And he was willing to be separated from his Father. Come on, Hushers. He was willing to be separated from his Father for you because it was so valuable to him to see reconciliation, to see peace. It was so important to him. Don't think that he set up a situation and where we got everything, he got nothing. There are two parables that Jesus gave in the New Testament. One of them was the parable of the stone, the, the jewel, and the other was the parable of the pearl. And both were incredibly valuable. And for both, the person who wanted to obtain them had to sell everything they had in order to get it. Those parables tell us that he does not see you as not worthwhile and not bringing anything to his kingdom. He sees you as very valuable. So valuable that he gave up everything that he had to get you. The enemy is telling you, you have no value, you have no worth. You're 
God's done with you. As we said before, you're too old, you're too young, you're too inexperienced, you're too this, you're too that. But God sees a different thing. He sees you as very valuable. So much so that he went out to get you. He gave everything. If you get into those two parables, you'll find out that the pearl represents the church. The jewel represents the Old Testament Christians. He saw them both. He saw their value. You have great value to God. So much so that he's on the cross with his body and his blood given to you for you. Thinking about you. Thinking about the peace that was coming. The reconciliation. On the night before, Jesus had the disciples in the upper room. We don't have our Bibles open to it right now, but you can go home and check this out if you want to make sure. Before supper, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. Do this. Or as often as you do this, do this in remembrance. We know from the Word of God that on his body was put our sicknesses, our diseases, and our pains. He bore them in his body so that we don't have to. There's two parts of salvation. One is the curse that came upon us from sin, which resulted in sickness, resulted in disease and pain. He took those things. And that was the body. And this was before supper. If you go back and you look at scripture, you'll find out that the cup was after supper. There's an entire meal in between the two parts. It was not part A and part B. This is one entire thing. His body was given for a purpose. And we spend our time learning the Word of God. What is the purpose of His body being given? But as we eat together, let's remember, His body was given for us. Let's not forget it. Make sure we understand why it was given. Let's eat together. After supper. He took the cup and said, this represents the blood of the new covenant. In the old covenant, the blood of bulls and lambs and goats, it just covered sin. But the new covenant, it washes clean. It's different. Now notice about the blood of Jesus Christ, there is nothing you need to add to it. The blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven you of all sin. You don't need your repentance. Well, I'm sorry. You need your. We need to repent. You don't need your penance. You don't need. Doesn't say anything about. Well, you need to do so many acts of good. No, we receive what He did. I repent of my sin, and I receive what He did. There is nothing from the body. It's part of the blood. Because the blood is all you need for forgiveness of sins. So if we have the blood in the body, there's a different purpose for the body. We've mixed it up. Some churches, they get one part right, they get the other part wrong. Sometimes we get the, the blood mixed up and we're always trying to add something to it. Always trying, well, yeah, but you got to at least act good. You always do good. you got to do some good deeds. And if you get to heaven and your good deeds that way your bad deeds and you get it, no. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin. Let's remember as we drink together. His blood forgave us. Don't let the devil bring up your past. Don't let the devil tell you, no, it's not completely done yet. It is. And you are set free. Let's drink together. Glory to God. Father, I thank you that we stand before you clean, redeemed, forgiven, washed by the blood. No demon in hell no devil in all his accusations can change that. Thank you for that power. And the restoration and the peace that we have between us and God. You, in Jesus, 
we see the great peacemaker. Glory to God. Thank you for it. We give you the praise and the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after service here, we have our covered this dinner. We sure hope that some of you can stay. All of you can stay. Um, if you if you can, don't worry if you didn't bring anything. We got we have food here. You brought extra. We're ready for you. Love to have you stay. We need to clear out some of the chairs if you can help us with that. If you can stay, we understand. It was great having you here for the service. And you have a blessed rest of your day.